Uh, my name is Mike Ostrowski, so I'm a professor at Stanford GSB. I do teach a first year course, so Jordan, if you have to take a, you know, a course and you're interested in these topics, you can take mine. It's one of the many of the required ones. Um, and it's unfortunately close to everyone else, so you know, it's only for MBAs. But I also teach some PhD electives, so if you're interested in these types of style of research, which is probably quite different from what you've seen, you know, reach out and there are lots of resources at Stanford uh, for this type of stuff. And this paper is joined with Michael Schwartz, who is a Stanford alum, who is now a chief economist at Microsoft. All right, so, uh, you know, the topic of the paper is carpooling and the economics of self-driving cars, and it is going to be very much an economics talk. Uh, and, you know, the connection to energy is actually pretty straightforward. I'm going to be talking about ways to try to minimize energy consumption. Right? I'm sure you've seen a lot of talks about, you know, improving energy production. Uh, I'm going to take the flip side, you know, if we can save a chunk of energy from being consumed, it's just as good, maybe even better than having the same chunk of energy being produced. So that's kind of the spirit of the, of the talk and the starting point. And I'll just start with this picture, which could have been taken anywhere in the world. Right? There, what got me started on this whole project uh, is the observation that traffic congestion is one of the, you know, the current you know, problem in human condition everywhere in the world, from you know, the richest places like you know, New York, Los Angeles, you know, San Francisco, to some of the poorest developing countries. Right? As soon as countries get rich enough to, for people to have cars, you very quickly run into road congestion. Uh, and a lot of attempts have been made in the past to try to relieve it, you know, public transportation, um, encouraging people to carpool, building more roads, and the, mostly they routinely fail. Uh, and we're hopeful that this may change in the future, but, you know, a lot of work is needed. Uh, and can our vision that I'm going to talk about in this paper is that there are three emerging technologies that will... Uh, transform transportation, hopefully will relieve congestion and all the corresponding ills, which you know, I'm not going to go through if you want to think about all the problems with congestion, you know, you can uh, read up on that. So the three technologies are, one is self-driving cars, and I'm not going to talk about that. It's, you know, it's in the news, you've seen all about that, and in fact, as I'm going to mention a bit later, it's actually not essential. The other two, for these purposes, are going to be potentially sufficient. So the other two technologies are less futuristic, uh, but potentially, you know, at least as impactful, maybe more. One is frictionless time-dependent tolls, uh, and the other is convenient, efficient carpooling. I'm going to go through them and explain, you know, why I'm talking about them in future tense. Uh, and the question we're trying to address here, you know, what will a market powered by these technologies look like? Uh, how should it be designed and organized, you know, to get uh, efficient, optimal transportation? All right, so let's talk about why I'm talking about these other two technologies, tolls and carpooling, in future tense, right? Because your reaction may be, well, we have tolls, right? And we have carpooling, so like, why am I talking about them in the future? And here is why. So let's talk about tolls first. So this is what tolls lo look right now. This is Bay Bridge, right? This is, you know, close by. Uh, and if you want to charge tolls, the current technology involves constructing these gates uh, and putting devices in cars and then as the car passes through the gate, it gets charged uh, a certain amount of money. Now, if you want to use that to raise revenue, you know, this works just fine. But if you want to use it to guide people's commuting decisions, right, pushing people to drive late or earlier, uh, this is problematic because each of those devices is very expensive, right, building each one of those things. First of all, it just costs a lot of money to build. Then you also need, you know, you need to widen the road, lots of you know, resources go into this. Uh, and just to kind of illustrate that, even on, the, on Bay Bridge, you only have it in one direction. So even if you said, okay, let's use this particular uh, toll system to, you know, uh, regulate transportation and have time-dependent tolls, well, you will only be doing it in one direction, you know, to San Francisco, and then from San Francisco, you won't be able to control it. Uh, and putting one of those on every single intersection is just impractical, I mean, it's just incredibly expensive, right? No one is going to do that. So we, for practical purposes, with some exceptions, we don't have tolls, right? With time-dependent, you know, uh, road-specific. So what's changing, and it's changing very soon. Uh, 2020 is not some kind of pie-in-the-sky dream. This is actually happening. And if you're interested, I can tell you more about what's going into this. 
uh, is the new technology where tolls are going to be uh, collected based on GPS locators, GPS locators in the cars. Right? At first, it seemed like it's just a technological difference, but there is a but the difference is crucial because once you charge tolls based on uh, GPS locators in cars, or equivalently, you can do it based on cameras that you know take pictures of license plates and intersection or some combination of those. Suddenly, you know, one, you know, it's expensive to build this infrastructure, but once you build it, you can now charge time-dependent tolls for every single intersection, every single road, right? And these can vary in time, and now you really can have uh, actual road pricing that's you know, used to optimize the flow of traffic. And so this picture is from Singapore. This, I mean, Singapore is, pioneer, is, a, is a pioneer in, in the road pricing, and this is from their Land Transport Authority. They're launching this in Singapore in 2020. Next year, they're transitioning from, the, you know, from this type of technology to a GPS-based one. And initially, they're not going to play with pricing. Initially, they're just going to charge the same exact prices for the same uh, roads that they used to charge in the past, but then they, you know, hopefully they will transition to a sort of more intelligent pricing. All right, so that's tolls. Uh, the second technology with that that may sound even more surprising. Why am I talking about carpooling in future tense? I mean that technology is trivial, right? You put another person in the car, you're carpooling, you're done. You know, what, what's the technology for? And to be more accurate, the technological improvement is going to come from removing the reducing the friction. Uh, involved in finding good carpooling partners, right? So if you think about this picture, again, which is, you know, could be taken anywhere in the world, almost immediately you know there are lots of people going in the same direction from the same direction, right? This is like, you see this picture, like lots of these people are very good carpooling partners. You just already know that because they're stuck on the same uh, part of the road. But they're not carpooling right now. It's just very inconvenient, right? It's a mess. You, you, you make plans with someone. You lose flexibility. Then their plans change. Their kids fall sick. They need to find a backup. It's just, it's just a mess. And empirically, people just don't carpool. Okay, very few people carpool. And of those who do, when you say, oh, like, you know, there are actually cars on carpool lanes. I see there are multiple people in the car. Well, almost all of them are either you know, people traveling together for work, like construction workers going somewhere, or family members traveling together. The number of people who are like genuine strangers who are carpooling just for the purpose of carpooling is just really trivial, really minimal. And so what's changing, there are now a bunch of startups, and this is very much an active area uh, where lots of things are happening. So you know, if you're interested in startups, that I think would be a very interesting one to participate in. Various startups trying to minimize frictions involved in finding carpool partners. So there is Waze that's doing it based on maps. You know, they already have a lot of people using their maps. So they're trying to leverage that into carpooling. Uh, there is Scoop that's trying to do it based on uh, people's coworker networks. They try to match coworkers because then they trust each other. They're happy carpooling with each other, and they're going to the same place. So it's easier to find good matches. Uh, there is Blah Blah Car that's trying to a more kind of casual approach, starting from long distance uh, carpools in Europe and trying to kind of move it to more um, sort of regular commuting carpools. And I don't know which one, is of, which one of these is going to succeed. Maybe m multiple ones, but you know, clearly a lot of people are working on this. So hopefully, in the near future, frictions involved in finding good carpool matches uh, is going to decrease substantially. Okay, so these are the technologies. Uh, and one of the points we really stress in the paper is that you know, it's kind of intuitive that each one of those technologies is nice. Uh, and useful, but what's especially powerful is the interplay among them, right? So we have these green arrows that what they're meant to emphasize is that self-driving cars are going to make both tolls and carpooling much more attractive, and I'm going to walk you through that. Uh, and then uh, tolls and carpooling dramatically reinforce each other. They're really highly complementary. Uh, and as I go through this, you know, on the next few slides, I'm only going to be able to touch on these points, you know, I only have uh, 20 minutes and then time for Q&A. There is a paper on my website with the same title as the title of the presentation. So if you're interested, you know, you can go and read them. All of these kind of reasons and bullet points are elaborated on in the paper. All right, but I will give you a flavor uh, of these arguments. So let's do this green kind of arrows one by one. Uh, so first, uh, what's the connection? Why, why is there a green arrow? Why, is, why are self-driving cars uh, making carpooling more attractive? And the basic logic, the basic intuition is that um, 
if you think about public transportation, if you think about just any kind of situation where one person is driving one or more people, more other people, the cost of the person driving others around is a very substantial part of that system, right? Drivers are expensive. Uh, not many people can afford to take Uber to and from work every day, right? You will do it kind of once or twice a week, uh, but it's really, it gets really expensive because you have to pay for another human being uh, to spend their time driving you around, okay? Uh, and for that reason, if you think about public transportation, most places in the world, the cost of that human being is, spend, is a split among many co-passengers, right? So you have large buses, you have large trains, and part of the reason is precisely to split that cost of that human across multiple co-passengers. Uh, once you have self-driving technology, that goes away. Suddenly it becomes feasible to have smaller vehicles that are more convenient, that don't make as many stops, uh, and basically, the way we think about this is once you have self-driving transportation, the line between kind of solo private driving and public transportation is going to be completely blurred, right? As instead of being kind of a discrete difference, you know, do I take my car to work or do I take a bus, public transportation becomes a continuous decision, right? Do I take my car, is it a small car, or am I willing to take kind of a bigger vehicle and take more stops? Uh, and kind of in the paper, we go through a lot of different bullet points emphasizing uh, what are the convenient features that make this combination particularly valuable. Okay, and I'm gonna skip them uh, in the interest of time. All right, uh, the second green arrow that I wanna talk about is why does autonomous transportation uh, make road pricing more attractive? There are, first, there are logistical reasons. Basic one being, you know, if you have autonomous self-driving cars, by definition, they have to know where they are and they have to track it, so attaching road pricing on top of that is just very easy. Just logistically, it's just much easier. The same thing uh, for passengers kind of telling the car where to go, just displaying the pricing information. So that's kind of more mechanical. But there is also a very important economic reason. This kind of typical reasoning in economics, but you know, if you haven't taken a lot of economics, this kind of thinking may be new, uh, is the equilibrium effect of self-driving cars during peak hours. So here's what I mean. So if you, when you think about you know, self-driving cars, you're like, oh, this is gonna be wonderful. Right now, when I'm stuck in traffic, I have to sit there and waste my time. Maybe I'll listen to an audio book or to the radio, but it's still nowhere near as productive as actually like sleeping or doing my work or doing something meaningful, right? And when I get a self-driving car, it's amazing, like the same half an hour, I will actually be able to do productive things, right? So that's, that's wonderful. How can that possibly be bad? Well, the way it's gonna be bad is that now everyone else is thinking the same way. And so now people who used to say, oh, I'll, I'll leave my home at 4.30 in the morning or at five in the morning in order to beat traffic, they say, oh, you know what? I'll still, I'll, I'm gonna leave at 8.30 because guess what? Even though I'm gonna be stuck in traffic, it doesn't matter because I'll, I'll just work. I'll, I'll make my conference calls. I'll sleep. I'll have breakfast. It really makes no difference. There's absolutely no reason for me to try to beat traffic. So suddenly, uh, precisely because the disutility of being stuck in traffic drops, the number of people who are willing to incur the disutility goes up, and the whole thing can equilibrate to the point where all the benefits uh, get undone. So in, in, in the initial state of the world, uh, you're stuck in traffic for half an hour, and you wasted half an hour, and now you're stuck in traffic in a self-driving car, you know, you're having breakfast and you're sleeping, but now it takes you two hours because a lot more people are now during, driving during that time. So that's, that's terrible, right? It's a terrible outcome. And again, if you're thinking about not just kind of human well-being, but also like economic cost, resource costs, and all this other thing, I mean, it's just terrible, right? Like the amount of energy that's wasted is just enormous. Uh, and we're not the only ones worried about that. You know, you can find other quotes. Here's one from Elon Musk, and the reason why I put this one here is because of all people, you would expect him to be the last one to, to, to mention this because he's, he's working on self-driving cars, right? So Tesla is trying to push them, but he's warning that a lot of people think that once you make cars autonomous, that they'll be able to go faster and that will alleviate congestion, and to some degree that will be true, but the amount of driving that will occur will be much greater with shared autonomy and actually traffic will get far worse, okay? So in a world like that, you really do need something like road pricing in order to give people incentives to still continue to try uh, to beat traffic or maybe take public transportation or find other ways not to generate more congestion, okay? So that's the second uh, green arrow. And now let me talk about the third one, 
actually that there is a pair the, the, at the bottom, these two, oh, you can see the, the tools and carpooling uh, that reinforce each other. And I think this is the most important one, uh, in part because, you know, who knows, maybe self-driving cars won't materialize in our lifetimes. It's still kind of science fiction. Uh, you know, I hope they will, but, you know, we don't know. Uh, and even if they don't materialize, a lot of the things I'm saying are going to be still going to be relevant, and in particular, this interaction at the bottom. So let me tell you uh, why that is. And it's a relatively simple observation, but we think it's really, really important. Uh, so why is there a complementarity between carpooling and road pricing? You know, what does complementarity mean? And in economic terms, it means that each of those by itself is only moderately effective, but together they're incredibly valuable. Okay, so it's the, it's the combination of the two that really, that, that's really going to work, whereas each one separately may not be that powerful. So let's do a very simple example. It's based on a paper by William Vickery from 1969. You know, I don't expect you to know this paper. You know, it doesn't really matter. You should be able to get the intuition for what I'm describing, even if you don't know it. So consider a congested road, right? Just think about, you know, a morning commute. Here is point A, point B, maybe you know, it's a bridge you know, into New York City or Bay Bridge, whatever. It's just, for simplicity, just one segment of the road, and we're only thinking about commute in one direction. Suppose it has a certain capacity, okay, what the throughput of the road is, and suppose twice as many people uh, want to take this road uh, during the available time. Okay, so obviously there's congestion, everything is bad, and there is not enough space for everyone. And now someone comes out, one of those apps comes out and there is like an amazing uh, carpooling app. You're still better off driving on your own. You still prefer, you know, a lot of people like driving on their own, but the disutility from driving solo is small. It's just some delta, okay? Well, guess what? This doesn't do anyone any good. Because, well, I'm still, I would like other people to carpool and it doesn't cost them very much, but I'm still individually better off by delta driving solo rather than uh, carpooling with someone. Okay, so you have this amazing carpooling technology, didn't improve anything. So now let's think about the other one, the classic economic solution that I'm sure you've heard of, uh, road pricing. And this is what actually uh, Vickery's paper was about. Let's compute optimal tolls based on people's willingness to pay, their value of time, all of that machinery. It's actually not that complicated, but you know, I'm not going to go into this. So you determine these optimal tolls, but suppose there is no carpooling, right? Everyone is driving solo, okay? So what, what happens in this world? So it is true that you fix carpooling. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, carpooling. You, you fix congestion, right? So the optimal tolls have the feature that the road is going to flow freely. That's wonderful. But, you know, there are still twice as many people who want to go during this period, which means a bunch of them are departing too early, a bunch of them are late for work, and your tolls have to be high enough to uh, encourage them to do that or put a different, discourage them from driving during peak times. And if you do the math, it turns out that these tolls are so high that they, for the drivers, they undo all of the benefits of free flowing traffic. So a mathematical statement is that each individual driver after these tolls is going to be just as well off as they were before you introduced the tolls. What's different is that what they used to pay in terms of their time of being stuck in traffic, now they pay in dollars. So society overall is better because instead of wasting resources, the government now collects that revenue, but now you're relying on the government to do something intelligent with it. You're, there's a lot of trust, political economy issues, and the drivers themselves, they don't feel any benefit. They're like, look, I'm now being gouged, and if they have budget constraints, which you know, most people in the world do, suddenly it's like, well, I need to make this money somewhere. Like, it's, it's just really uh, not a pleasant outcome, and every time toll roads are proposed, a lot of people get upset. And it's bad even if people have kind of similar willingness to pay. If you have richer people and poorer people, there's a whole new dimension that rich people are able to go when they want to go and then poor people have to stay home, right? So that's again politically uh, really, uh, really unattractive. And the last point is that even though you're solving the problem that roads are no, no longer congested, you still have a bunch of people ar arriving at work at suboptimal times. A lot of them arrive too early, a lot of them arrive too late, Technologically, you have not increased the throughput of the road, right? You just kind of rearrange people in time. So each one of those, you know, they have some bite, but not much. So now suppose, again, in the same very simple example, you have both. You have convenient carpooling uh, and you set toll, tolls optimally, okay? So now the magic thing happens because now all you have to do is to set the tolls a bit above delta, 
or more accurately, a bit above delta over two, that gives people incentive to carpool, right? Because you're now setting them just above their disutility from carpooling. And now each car carries two people, and you relieve congestion. And notice that even if the government just steals all the revenue, or destroys it, or burns it, or loses it, or whatever, all the drivers are still substantially better off, right? And everyone gets to work on time. It's really this combination that's really powerful, OK? All right, so I have, what, five minutes left? All right, so I'm not going to take you through the model. So what we, I'll just kind of advertise what we have in the paper, and then I'll make one last observation. So in the paper, we set up a, mathem a mathematical model of such a market, right? There are lots of models of transportation, obviously. There are lots of papers on um, road pricing, starting with Vikra. What's special about our paper and why we need a new framework is that we also in introduce this coalition formation component where we also need to figure out who is driving with whom and how much they need to pay uh, and how those payments are determined. Okay, so in the model, you know, I'm not gonna take you through it. We have a set of riders, we have a set of road segments, time stamps, uh, we have some capacitors for those road segments, some trips that people may want to take, uh, and then we look at various assignments, and then uh, what's important is there are going to be two sets of prices in the system. One set of prices is the optimal tolls set by the government, but the other set of prices is going to be how much the riders actually pay, and very importantly, if the toll from A to B is you know, $7, and seven people are sharing a vehicle, then each of them only pays a part of that, right? It could be each one pays a dollar, it could be some other sharing, but the tolls are segment specific and not person specific. Okay, that's what makes it powerful. All right, and then sort of our main result of the paper is that if you, in this model, if you set up these prices correctly, uh, you get sort of the optimal outcome where the total welfare net of costs uh, is optimized. And you know, obviously I don't have time to take you through the math, but as I said, it's all in the paper. All right, last point I want to make. And it's actually very important. It's something, it's not directly related to what we have in the paper, but although we use some of this intuition, uh, you often hear in the newspapers the following uh, complaint observation statement. So this is from the Wall Street Journal, you know, from three and a half years ago, but it's like super, typical observation, where people say, look, the absurdity of our century-old ad hoc approach to mobility is captured in one statistic. The utilization rate of automobiles in the U.S. is about 5%. For the remaining 95% of the time, 23 hours, our cars just sit there, a slow, awful cash burn like condos at the beach. Right? So, like, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the statistics in, in many, many times, many places. And our view, our claim, and what we explain in the paper, like, this is a total red herring. And just to give you an analogy, you know, I have a roll of paper towels in my kitchen, and it sits unused probably 99.9% .9 of the time, okay? And no one thinks of that as like a slow, awful cash burn. Why? Well, because it's, you know, I'm kind of using it gradually. Once I use it up, I get a new roll. And if I was sharing it with my neighbors, well, it, just would, just, it would get used up twice as fast. There would not be that much benefit uh, in doing that. The same is true for cars, okay? So, uh, you can, we, we do a simple numerical example in the paper. If you have an empty car, it's really not that expensive for that car uh, to sit and wait. Now, if you have parking issues, that's a whole different consideration. But in the world where parking is available, like in the suburbs, uh, it's really not a problem. So we do a typical numerical example where, you know, cars die after 200,000 miles or 15 years. New car is $30,000. Real interest rate is low. Uh, and then we just do the basic math. What is the cost per mile of using this car for different levels of car utilization? And if you use your car rarely, like you know, if, you, if your car's annual mileage is 5,000 miles per year, if you triple that, you really do have substantial savings, right? Because in that world, when you don't drive the car too much, it does die of old age. It's like if my roll of uh, paper towels uh, is sitting kind of unused for 10 years, eventually, you know, the ants will eat it or it will turn yellow or something bad will happen. So there is an aging component, but you have to use it very, very slowly for that to kick in. Once you get to some reasonable levels, right, you know, even 15,000 miles per year, which is like not, I mean, it's not crazy. Like most people who commute to, to work regularly in the car hit that number or something close. From that point on, even if you multiply your car utilization by a factor of five, 
crazy, crazy high, very hard, you're only saving two cents out of 48 cents per mile. So again, when you see this type of lament, that's really not a problem, at least uh, in the current world. Now compare that uh, to car utilization as in how many people are in the car. So that's the second bullet point. And then I'll get to the first one. So if you think about car utilization as what fraction of time the car is on the road, that's not relevant. That's just not a relevant number. If you think that the way to save energy you know, and save the planet is just to make sure that cars drive, kind of stay idle more, it's not going to work. Right? It helps you a little bit. However, if you think about car utilization in terms of how many people are in the car at the same time, when you double car utilization in that sense, you are increasing energy efficiency and everything else by a factor of two. If you have five people in the car, you are doing better by a factor of five. Again, in contrast to this picture where when you go from 15,000 to 75,000, so you utilize car five times and intensely in the time dimension, that really doesn't do you any good. Okay? And I'm going to skip the first bullet point, so I'll just stop here and take questions. Yes. Hi. Um, so uh, with respect to this last point of filling up cars with more people, that, that should work, yeah. Um, but another option could be to just make cars a lot smaller. And I know that a lot of, um, a lot of companies have been doing concepts in that area for like many decades, decade, decades now in the stats supported, I think that I, a given car, um, or at a given moment, 80 something percent of the cars are occupied by one person or so. So um, I wonder why carpooling is such a popular uh, s suggestion for a solution, and personal mobility doesn't seem to be. So okay, couple of, couple of answers to this. I don't know, right? Your guess is probably as good as mine, but I have, I, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of conge uh, conjectures. First of all, for individually, for you individually, a bigger car is going to be safer, right? If you take your smart car and I hit it with my Hummer, I don't have a Hummer, but suppose I did, <laughs> right? I know who is going to be worse off. So on the individual level, each person feels like, oh, I want the safest car available. So it naturally tends you towards heavier and bigger cars. And trying to regulate that is just incredibly hard. Right? Imagine you're like, you know, telling a mom with kids, like, no, you cannot have the safe car because it's bad for the other drivers. You have to drive the small dinky cars. Just politically very hard. Um, but I think in, from the point of view of congestion, I, I actually don't know. I don't think that having like one smart car, uh, like even if it's a single passenger, but it still kind of takes a reasonable amount of space, like more, let's say more, more than a motorcycle. Yeah, but it's, very, it's, it's an inefficient design. I mean, you could, you could no, no, use... But, but again, I'm, I'm, like, so if you think about from the point of view of congestion, right? If, if you replace, let's take you, you replace a typical five-person sedan with a smart car, I don't think it creates that much less congestion. Because there is still a lot of congestion comes from like braking before, braking after. So all of that space around the cars, like I think if you can put two of them, if you can make the lanes half as wide, maybe you can get it. But that's just such a massive, massive change. So I think it's, I think it's the kind of thing if you're designing a city from scratch, that's something that I think might be viable, right? You're just decide or like a retirement community and, like, and you just find a way to, to enforce that. Taking an, an existing city, especially like you know, something like the Bay Area where we can't even build an extra mile of BART and trying to impose something like that, I just think it's political, it's just much harder. Yes? So to build on what Tal said, um, does your road pricing model allow for uh, taxing basically uh, one person commuting via some kind of a huge, enormous gas tax? So what we show is you don't need to do that. So what we show is that it's sufficient to tax to, to, to tax things purely based on uh, the road segments. And then the way this is going to, the way what you want is going to work is that if I'm driving with three other people, I'm paying one third of that toll. And then if you want to help poorer people, you can remove all the other taxes, right? So you can say, look, we're not going to have a gas tax. We're not going to have a sales tax on cars, but we will have pretty high tolls. So for people who are carpooling, then their net effect is going to be better. Because they're saving a lot of money on those taxes, and now they're paying something on taxes, they're, they're not better off. And people who insist on driving solo, they will be hit the hardest. But, but wouldn't gas tax, uh, aside from having a similar effect to uh, tolls, also reduce possibly the um, carbon 
So yeah, so you, you can have both, right? So you can, I mean, there, there, there are two separate policies, right? So it's actually, it's, it's important to think, to think about this. So, I mean, in economics, there's just basically general basic lessons you should tax like the thing that you're worried about. So when you're worried, for the purposes of carbon emissions, like for example, if you want to pe people to switch to uh, electric cars, uh, then gas gasoline tax is the right thing to do, right? Because it forces them to use a different type of uh, fuel. But what it doesn't give you is kind of time pattern, right? If you want, if you want people to drive you know, at 5 in the morning or 10 a.m. and avoid rush hour, gas tax doesn't give you that, whereas this thing does. And so if, you, if I could set an optimal policy, you would have both. One, to encourage people to use the right type of fuel and energy, and the other one to encourage them to drive at the right time. Yes? But then, do you think people might modify modify their car to have a GPS, um, but then change, remove the part which sends out the signal for where they are for the tolls? I mean, we regulate a lot of things, right? It's sort of, and I, I think it depends on the country, depends on the legal environment. But yeah, I mean, I, this isn't. I mean, it's you can you, you can mandate it to be, that it be done at the level of the car manufacturer, right? Cars already have this o, o, OBD or ODB computer, so you can just have that as part of that. Yeah, so if I take a question from that part of the room, because. I know I naturally gravitate to, yes? Last question. Last question, all right. And then I'll, I'll be around. You can ask me for another 10 minutes. So my question kind of piggybacks a little bit about off of what was already asked, which is there's a lot of work being done on the technology behind self-driving cars. It seems somewhat inevitable at this point that it, it will come. My question I is. I hope so. I hope, you're I, right. I hope so. But my question is, um, on the things that you're talking about, specifically the policy architecture, do you think there's enough work being done, uh, and a little bit on the technology side, on the as far as like the ancillary technologies you would need to capture things like carpooling and tolling and things like that? Is there enough being, work being done to kind of receive the self-driving cars once they're ready to go, or are the state and local governments going to be lagging so far behind that? So okay, that's that's an excellent question, and my answer is an emphatic no. And that's the reason why we wrote this paper. It's literally the way we started working. We'll then realize the paper is relevant even in the world without self-driving cars. But the way we started working on this is like about five years ago, we said, you know, all this stuff is happening. What's gonna, how is the world going to be different? And at first we were just talking. And then over time we realized like people are just not thinking about these types of stuff. And with road pricing and policy, one thing that over the years becomes clear is that status quo is very powerful. Like a bunch of this thing, like you have to you have to get them right from the start. It's very hard. So it's, if basically, if people are used to the idea that you know roads are free, which like there are lots of other government services that are not free. Like my water in my house is not free. Like why are the roads free and my wa and water is not? Like it's actually like not clear, but it's just people are very used to it. It's very hard to change. So in particular, if I was advising policymaker, like how do you get something like this in place? given that people are used to the idea that roads are free. And one way to do it, which I'm sure a lot of self-driving car people will hate, is you start out by just doing this for empty self-driving cars. You say, what we're going to do is we're just going to charge empty. When the self-driving car is empty, they have to pay these things. And then when people see that it's not the end of the world, you just have kind of reasonable you know, instrument, then you can start expanding this into like, you know, all self-driving cars. So you kind of gradually build from that. But the transition, quite, I mean, it's massive. Because once people are used to something, it's just incredibly hard to take it away from them, even if on the overall ground, you know, it's the right thing to do. Okay. With that, we thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you, you for being here.